Okay, this is Mac 1140 Pre-Calculus, Section 5.8. And in this section, we're going to be taking a look at some applications involving exponential and um, logarithmic growth. We're going to look at exponential growth and decay models, as well as Newton's Law, and also logistic growth and decay models. Okay, we're going to start, first of all, with... Um, some very typical um, exponential application problems in this section which have to do with interest. Um, this is what you learn about interest in some of the classes that come before this. You might concentrate on simple interest. Once we get into Mac 1105 in this course, we tend to um, concentrate on uh, compound interest and other forms of interest. This is compound interest earned um, annually where there are different compounding periods. That's what you see here for the N. And I'm going to write out what each of those things means, although it's already printed here. So the final amount, this is always, uh, I'll put it over here where I have room, the final or ending amount. And a formula similar to this is really going to take control of pretty much this whole section for many of the problems in this section, not every single one. Um, here what you're seeing is a P. So the P is the initial amount, also known as the principal. The initial amount in the count. Uh, if you recall from... Previous courses, you may remember this, but simple interest, you just multiply principal of the initial amount times the rate of interest, but used as a decimal. Your rates are always used as a decimal, and then the number of uh, years that you're leaving it in the bank account. Um, and whatever it turns out that you're being paid in interest, because interest is the bank's way of paying you for being their customer and keeping your money in their bank, which they can then use for loans and various other um, activities in the bank. So um, with a simple interest, once you figure out what that interest amount is after the first year, because they calculate it at the end of each year, at one year, at two years, you get paid the same amount at the end of every year. So it's almost like having a job where you don't get a raise in subsequent years. You just get paid the same salary every single year. None of us want that, of course, but I can just um, compare it to that. So let's say that you were you figured out your interest after one year for simple, and you the bank was paying simple interest. You'd be getting, let's say you got paid $90 at the end of the first year for however much money you had in the bank account. You would then get paid $90 at the end of every year. Your interest amount uh, would not go up. However, compound interest, you're being paid on the amount of money that you've invested plus the interest that you have gotten from the subsequent year. So on the first year, they match the amount that you're paid through simple interest versus compound interest. But for every year after that, you are, the amounts start to separate and the compound interest is always more than uh, simple interest because you're getting paid once again on your principal amount plus also the interest that you've earned. So that base amount gets bigger and bigger, whereas for simple interest, they do not calculate it like that. So you're going to see some things here. Um, you have the P for principal meaning principal, and that's just your the initial amount that you invested in the account. Uh, this R, that R is your rate of interest, has to be a decimal. So anything that they give you in percentage form, you're going to change it to a decimal. And then N, that N is um, the number of compounding periods. And it says it right here, uh, compounded n times per year. That means how many times they're going to go into your bank account during the year and calculate interest. So they actually give you a little bit of interest. Let's say they're going to do it quarterly. Quarterly, like four quarters and a dollar. Quarterly would mean four times a year you're, they're going to go into your account and pay you interest on your base amount plus uh, whatever interest you've earned um, presently. And then they'll go in that second time, and a third time, and a fourth time during that year. 
So let's see. Uh, this would be number of compounding periods per year. And there's different words that they could use to tell you how often they're going to go into your account, which would refer to N. And um, so they could say annually, meaning they're only going to go into that account once. They could say semi-annually, that means they're going to go in twice. They could go in monthly, and that means they're going to go in there 12 times during the year and pay you interest, and so forth. So different words that they can use to indicate how many times they're going to go into your account, and that would be your N value. And then T um, is going to be number of years. Now, if they make a comment that they're doing it um, compounded annually, then that, N val then that T value will be 1. Okay, so for instance, let's go use that formula to answer this very first question. We are going to compound this annually, semi-annually, and quarterly. So with respect to the T value, because they've made this comment initially, 7% compounded annually. That means that your T is going to be 1 because of this comment right here. And then we're going to respond with different N values based on these words. So annually, that would mean they're going to go into your account just once over the course of a year. Here they're going to come in, they're going to go into your account twice over the course of a year. Here they're going to go in four times over the course of a year. And we're going to calculate the interest in each of these cases. Okay, so first one is annually. And so we're going to do the final amount in the account is equal to, and we're just going to be looking at this formula right up here, principal. The principal is $1,000 times 1 plus the rate divided by the number of compounding periods. And right now I'm doing annually, so it's going to be the rate as a decimal divided by 1. Okay, the rate would be 0.07, that represents 7%, divided by 1, raised up to a power of n times t. So n is 1 in this case, t is 1 in this case. So this is basically just going to be 1,000, 1 plus 0.07 is 0.07, and then you have a power of 1, so you don't need to write it. So you can go ahead and put that amount in your calculator. <coughs> And when you put that in your calculator, you get $170. Oops. $170. Okay, next going to the next part, which is to calculate for semi-annual into your account semi-annually. Okay, so here n is 1, here n is 2. Okay, so this time the amount is going to be again, look at that formula above, principal. And it's going to be 1 plus the rate, so goes the formula, divided by the number of compounding periods. And then up here, the power is n times t. This time n is 2, and t is 1 for all of these. We're doing it over the course of one year. Whoops, I don't have enough zeros in here, so let me fix that. this over a bit. Okay, so when you're going to go put this in your calculator, you might want to calculate this amount first, 0.07 divided by 2 added to 1. And then you can put the whole thing in your calculator. So 0.07 divided by 2 is equal to this plus 
one is 1.035. So this is going to be a thousand in your calculator times 1.035, which is this 0.07 divided by 2 plus 1, raised up to a power of 2 times 1, which is 2. Put that in your calculator, and you will have the amount that you end up with in your account when they go in there twice over the course of a year and compound. So 1,000 times 1.035 raised up to a power of 2, and that's 1,000. $71.23. All right, two answers. Third answer, we're going to go in and do it quarterly, compounding quarterly. So here the amount would be 1000 and this time it would be 1 plus 0 0.07. The number of compounding periods is 4 this time. And is 4 when you're talking quarterly. They're going into your account 4 times during the course of a year. Then it's n times t as the power. Again, the n is 4. There it is right there. State it again. Times 1. Because they're doing this over the course of one year. So this will be a thousand, probably best to just get a single number in here. You know the power is going to be four. So for what's in here, it's 0 0.07 divided by four plus one. Point oh seven divided by four plus one is 1.0175. Okay, then to finish that off, that's going to be 1,000 times 1.0175. You don't really need the parentheses, but we'll just put it on there. And this is 1,071 and 86 cents. Okay, there we go using compound interest in an annual, semi-annual, and quarterly case. Okay, moving next to the type of interest where they are giving you interest or where they're compounding continuously. So we don't have a set number of times that they're going in. This is what we call a continuous type of compounding, and that formula was right here. The amount after two years due to an initial principal invested at an annual interest rate compounding continuously is the following formula. So you don't have a number of compounding periods anymore. It's just principal times E. Once you move into a continuous compounding situation, <clears throat> The base here is E multiplied by R times T. Once again, R is the rate. If you can't see this, I know it's a little bit small. It says P times E, and then the power is R times T. <clears throat> you don't forget to use the every formula. When, you, when they're doing a rate as a percentage, you're going to use it as a decimal. And then the T is the amount of time in years. So let's go to this next problem and use that PERT formula. <clears throat> Let's just write that right here. So the final amount with a beginning amount of $20 times E raised up to a power of, okay, your R is going to be 0 0.12. That's the same thing as 12%. You just take the decimal and move it two places to the left when you want to turn it into a decimal. And it's going to compound for two years. Okay, so this is going to be entered in your calculator as 20 times E raised up to a power of 0.24. 
try to get a single power there before you put it in your calculator. That comes out as 0.24. So final amount in the account. It's not going to be much higher because you're only leaving it in for two years and you only started with a small amount. So after uh, two years, it's going to be 20 times. Call up that E raised up to a first power, which is in the first column. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven keys down and put in the power which is 0.24. And it ends up that you have $25.42 after two years. <clears throat> Again, just because you, you invested such a small amount so it doesn't go up much. And because, like I said, the, uh, it, you're only leaving it in there for two years. If you left it in for longer, it would be a better situation. And if your principal is bigger, it would be a better situation. Okay, now we go into the formula that can be used for uninhibited growth. That is this formula right here. And it can also be used for uninhibited decay, when decay just keeps continuing and continuing and progressing, or growth just continues and progresses at an, uh, at an exponential rate. The only difference is that when it is being used for a growth model, the K value will be positive. And therefore, we would call this the rate of growth. We're talking about the K value. It can either be called the rate of growth, that K value right there. And that'll be when it's a positive K value. Or, and in that case, this would be a growth model. Or it can be called the rate of decay. And you would know that it's decay when the K value is negative. Okay, so this formula can be used for growth or decay, uninhibited types of growth or decay. And um, we're going to take a look at that in example three. So in example three, it says strontium-90 is a radioactive material that decays according to the function. And they give you a function where they've already set it up for you. You can see that it is decaying, and that's because this... Uh, this rate of decay is negative. That's the rate right there is always the coefficient of T in this formula. So it's a rate of decay rather than a rate of growth because it's negative. Where A sub 0 is the initial amount, so this is kind of just like the formulas that you've been looking for at interest, uh, having to do with interest, where you had an initial amount right here. It, it was called principal when you were doing the interest formulas, and this over here was just called A. Uh, it was the final amount. It's still like that. This is the final amount. You can plug in various values of T, but really, uh, the, this, this whole thing collectively is called the final amount. <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, it, yeah, let's see. So in this problem now, <clears throat> we're going to answer several types of questions, round to different places. And um, take a look at what kind of decay is going on in the problem. So it says, assume here, after they explain what it is, assume that a scientist has a sample of 800 milligrams of strontium-90. That 800 milligrams is the initial amount. So that's going to be the A sub 0 in this formula that you're talking about. <clears throat> So the very first question, uh, in part A, it just says, uh, what is the decay rate? The decay rate is this right here. But they're asking you to give it as, convert the rate to a percentage. You know how my, my lab math will tell you to give it in a certain way, so you want to make sure that you know how to give this as a percentage. If something's already a decimal and you want to, change it into a percent, you can either multiply it by 100, or you can just move the decimal two places over. That's the same thing as multiplying 100. So given it as they have asked for it here as a percentage, this is going to be 2.44%. negative That's it. Nothing to really calculate for that problem. Just slide that decimal two places over. In part B, 
And part B, they're saying, how much strontium-90 is left after 10 years? That means they want you to evaluate this decay model at a time called 10 years. So you're going to put the 10 there, then the 10 right here. This is just a, this side is just an announcement that you're about to evaluate at 10. And over here on the right, where the function rule is, that's where you're going to plug in all the numbers. So you want to put the initial amount I had mentioned right here that they gave this one amount in the last sentence of the problem, and that is the beginning amount. Assume that a scientist has a sample, meaning he's beginning with a sample size of 800 milligrams of strontium-90. So we're going to put the 800 right there, multiplied by E. Now, when you're actually doing the problem, leave it, leave it in its decimal form. You don't need to write that leading zero. You can just write all the numbers that are on the right side of the decimal just to save some space. And we are evaluating at 10, and you can just put all of that in your calculator. Just 800 times e to the negative 0.0244 times 10. I should turn it on. That might help. 800 times second function e. And the power that we have there is point, negative 0 0.0244 times 10. Negative 0 0.0244 times 10. Close that up to create the power. And you are at approximately, uh, for part B, we're going to round to the nearest whole number. I just selected the sample type of instructions that went along with this type of problem in my lab math. So they have you rounding some to the nearest whole number. So the nearest whole number here would be approximately 627 milligrams. So this is the final answer for part B. This is the final answer for part A. So I should be highlighting this, these as I go along. I'll get, catch the other ones on the previous page later. Okay, so part C. When will only 200 grams of strontium be left? Because it's decaying. So you're losing more and more strontium-90 as time passes. So this is like saying, when will the final amount... 200 grams. Over here, this right here, the A sub T, is the final or ending amount. You can call it the final amount or the ending amount. So you want to take all of this, this A sub T, and just put 200 in place of it. And then on the other side, you're going to put the initial amount, which was 800 times e to the negative 0 0.0244 t. And since they're saying when, that means you're solving for time. At what point would there only be 200 left as your final amount? So to solve this sort of thing, you want to get the e raised to a power all by itself, no coefficient. So you're going to, because then we're going to take the natural log of each side as we did quite a bit in the previous section when we were learning how to solve logarithmic uh, and exponential equations. So get rid of that coefficient first. This will be 1 fourth, or you can think of it as 0.25. It'll be easier to put in the calculator that way. 2 over 8 is 1 fourth, it's the same thing as 0.25. And over here you have e to the negative 0.0244. But what we learned in section 5.6, the section before this, was that um, when you can't make these bases the same, <clears throat> you take the log of each side to solve it. So it's going to be the ln of 0.25 and the ln of e to the negative 0.0244 times t. Remember, ln has a base of e, therefore the inverse property works here. The argument matches the base. They take each other out, leaving you with just what was in this power position. And then ln of 0.25, we'll get an approximation there. Okay, so that's negative 1 point. I'll just write some of the numbers here, but in my calculator, I'm going to leave all the numbers so that I can get a more exact answer. 0.386294. And of course it goes on. I'm leaving all of the numbers in my calculator for to get an 
an exact as an exact answer as possible. An answer that's exact as possible. Okay, so <clears throat> I have the negative 1.38 on the left side, and I have this negative 0.0244 on the right side, and I'm going to divide off the 0 0.0244, the negative 0 0.0244 on both sides so that I can solve for t. And so that is approximately, let's see, for part C, uh, C and D weren't around to the nearest tenth place, so 56.8. 56 <clears throat> so 56.8, and this is in years. They'll probably fill that in, though, for you, and they'll just put the 56.8 in my lab math. Okay, moving to part D. What is the half-life? Well, when you're talking about half-life, <clears throat> what you want to find out in that particular case is when is there half the amount? So in part D, I'll try to fit that in right here. If you're starting with 800 and you're at the half-life, then there would only be half of that, which is 400 for the final amount. So 400 right here on the left side, replacing all of this, a a, uh, a sub t, or A evaluated at t. The initial amount, 800. <clears throat> okay, and times e to the negative 0 0.0244t. Okay, then just like we solved <clears throat> the problem in part c, we're going to get rid of this coefficient first. That's going to leave you with e to the negative 0 0.0244t. This is half of this. One half is the same thing as 0.5. Then you're going to have to use natural logs to solve this. So I'm going to go natural log of 0.5 and natural log of e raised up to the negative 0.0244t. This has a base of e, therefore the arg argument cancels with the base, takes the log with it, and down comes the exponent, negative 0.0244t, and we're going to get this in our calculator. <clears throat> so we'll write down some of those numbers but actually leave the whole value in the calculator window. So negative, just so I can show you this stuff, so I have to write some of these, 693, 1472, all right. Okay, so that's just some of the numbers. <clears throat> Right, so if you're going to solve for t, that means you're going to divide this coefficient right off of the t. And whatever you do to the left side, you have to also do to the right side. So you'll be dividing by that same number on the opposite side. So in the calculator, we still have this entire number divided by negative point zero two four four. And for that particular problem, you get uh, around to the tenths place again, approximately 28.4. 28.4 years. Okay, that completes parts A through D using the uninhibited, and it was a decay model in this case, just because the K value was negative. They could ask you all these same questions, and you would go about all of them the same way, only instead of a negative power or a negative growth rate, they would have a positive growth rate and call it a growth model. <clears throat> okay, let's see. I uh, just wanted to say a little bit more about half-life, give you a little explanation in case you don't have a background where you know any 
or you've heard anything about that, just um, radioactive substances have a specific half-life, which is the time required for half of the substance, we talked about this in the last problem, to decay, to get down to half of what you started with. Carbon dating uses the fact that this is what um, some students don't realize that it's used for, but, you know, it's a pretty heavy science concept. Carbon dating uses the fact that all living organisms contain two kinds of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-14. While an organism is living, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is constant. But when an organism dies, the original amount of carbon-12 remains unchanged, while the amount of carbon-14 begins to decrease. So by... Um, Calculating how much of the carbon-14 has decreased, you can tell how long ago something died, and that is important in a lot of cases that we study. The change in the amount of carbon-14 present relative to the amount of carbon-12 makes it possible to calculate when the organism has died. Okay, so we have a problem, <clears throat> again, that uses this concept. We're going to be using that same formula. Uh, that we used in the last problem. Okay, which again is final amount, initial amount, rate of decay, and then uh, time in years. Okay, so in this problem it says the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,600 years. They're, basically what they're saying here is that it takes 5,700 years to go from the initial amount to half the amount. They're just actually telling you how long it takes, whereas in the last question, we were actually looking for that. If a piece of charcoal made from wood, the, made from the wood of a tree, shows that only 61% of the carbon exposed uh, shows only 61 of the carbon-14 expected in a living organism. When did the tree die? Do not round until the final answer. Then round to the nearest whole number. Now this has actually two parts because you do not have um, the rate of decay here. And you need to find the rate of decay associated with a half-life of 5,600 years. Okay, so that's going to be part one. Find K, which is the rate of decay. You need to find that K value associated with that half-life of 5,600 years. So we're going to see what the K value is, and then we can go on to use a more complete formula by knowing what the K value is to then go, come and drag the 61% in. So not ready for that yet. Right now what we're going to do is we're going to say there's an original amount, and if you know how long it takes for that original amount to decay to just half of the original amount. So right in here for the final amount, we're going to say that this is half the final amount of the original. And we actually know how long it takes for this to occur. So copying the rest of this formula, E times K, and for T, we happen to know that this is going to occur in 5,600 years as we go from the full amount to half the amount. <coughs> All right, so now what we can do here is we can divide a sub 0, because this is a variable. We don't know what a sub 0 is. So we can divide that same variable right out of the equation, giving us a simpler equation of 1 half, which is 0.5. And then over here we have e. Move this over a little bit. e to the 5,600 times k. Right, which a, a product can be written either way, k times 5600 or 5600 times k. I'm just going to write it like that. 
Then we've looked at solving this type equation in several problems in the previous section as well as in this section. You can't make these bases the same. So therefore, you're going to solve this by taking the ln of both sides. On this side, everything pretty much melts away except the 5600 because ln's always have a base of E, and when the base matches the argument, they go away. Take that with it, and down comes the 5600. Okay. <coughs> Here, we're going to get this from the calculator, just as we have in the previous three problems. So we're going to go... And I believe we just got this in another problem. Not the same in the calculator window, actually. <clears throat> so approximately negative 0.693, 1472. And of course it goes on and on. I have most of the numbers, but I'm leaving the actual entire number in my calculator window. So if I want to solve for K, I'm just going to divide 5600, and you see that a lot of these problems are done in a very similar fashion. So let me move this down. Just a little nicer. Okay, so I still have that entire number right there in the window. So I'm going to go that. It'll still hold that divided by 5600. So if you just come in here and go divided by 5600, it's pulling that last uh, number that's showing there. Okay, so this K turns out to be... <clears throat> Okay, it's an exponential notation. I'm going to take it out of exponential notation so that it is easier to work with. So, just a little refresher of exponential notation. When you see that the exponent, this really means negative 1.23, blah, 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 times 10 raised up to a power of negative um, 4. And if you want to get that out of base 10 exp exponent negative 4, that means that this coefficient is actually smaller than what you're seeing here. And you can see how small it is by just moving this decimal four places to the left, moving it in a manner or in a direction, the decimal, that will actually make it smaller than what it is near now, because that's what a negative exponent indicates. So moving this once to get around the one, and then three more times filling in those blank spots with zeros. That'll get it out of scientific notation. So this is negative 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, I'll just write 7, 7, 6. You know there's more numbers there. That's just approximate. Okay, so you have that K value right there. And once you have the K value, then you can bring in this other information that says there's a piece of... Um, charcoal made from the wood of a tree shows only 61% of the carbon-14 that's expected in living matter. In other words, it's changing because it's decaying. Um, when did the tree die? So now we can do part two now that we know K. So now we're going to talk, we're going to, you know, show that we understand that there's only 61% of the original carbon left. So again, looking at this formula, we have the original amount of carbon, of the carbon uh, 14, and then we're saying that only 61% of that original amount of carbon is now present in the organism, or in the uh, piece of wood that they got from the tree. And then don't forget that this side, that original amount gets multiplied by E raised up to a power of K times T. But we know what the K is because we just found it for uh, 5,600 years, the K value associated with 5,600 years. So negative 0 0.00123776, I'll hold it out to that many digits just for accuracy, times T. Okay, 
similar to what I the method that I just used to solve the previous problem, you can get rid of this variable, a sub zero, which stands for the original amount. Divide it off of the right side and divide it off the left side, and then you'll just have a number. You'll just have 0.61, and then over here you'll just have e to the negative 0 0.0001237762. And we can solve by t, just like we solve for t, just like we did in the previous part of this problem, part one. So ln, ln of this side, realizing that the base is e and that these two take each other out with the natural log, leaving you with just this. And then get that in your calculator. So this is going to be ln of 0.61, close that, and that is, I'll just write some of these numbers, but hold the whole, I'll hold the entire number in the calculator window. So 0.494296. And there's more numbers there. Okay, and then I'm going to solve for t by dividing off its coefficient. T is approximately, rounding off here, if you put the number that's in the window, hold the whole number, divided by 0.00012377, would be approximately, whoop, they were both negative. So I can just, it's okay, I can cancel that. So they, the number just comes out, 3993, approximately. If we round to the nearest whole number, which it says to in the instructions, round to the nearest whole number, about 3,993 years. That divided by that is this. Okay. And that completes example four. Highlight your final answers. So here, I needed to find this just to get, they didn't ask for this, but I needed this to get this. So this is the actual final answer. Okay. I'll just make sure I highlighted all the answers here so you know exactly what the final answer was for each of these. Those are the compound entrance problem answers. And on this page, I highlighted both of the final answers at the top as well. Here, they didn't ask for this, but I needed it to get this. And I'll just go to example five, see what's going on in that problem. Okay, so this is one common science problem, physics problem engineering problem. Here we go with that one. Let's get everything out of the way. All right, so this is called Newton's Law of Cooling, and it states that the temperature of a heated object decreases exponentially over time based on the temperature of the surrounding medium. Okay, so in this particular problem, First, let's try and understand what each thing in this formula counts for, as we always do when we encounter a new formula, and then see if we can apply it to example five. So, again, just like uh, every formula used in this section, what you see right here, this U evaluated at T, that is the ending amount or the final amount. You could call it either one. It means the same thing. Okay, then this T that you see here, big capital T that you see in both of these places, that is the temperature of the surround, the, the temperature of the surroundings. That's how I can put it in as short of text as possible. 
the temperature that the hot object, the temperature of the surroundings that the hot object is going to be placed in. Temperature of the surroundings. Whatever that temperature is, it's going to be used there and there. Okay, this U sub zero that you see right here, that is the original or the initial temperature of the heated object one that's going to be losing heat and kind of acclimating to the surroundings. So the initial temperature. <clears throat> K will be a negative value because the temperature is going down. And you're going to be um, taking that initial temperature minus the temperature of the surroundings, multiplying it by E, raised up to a power of K times T. Okay, so let's try and apply this. There are several parts to this problem. I'm going to try and fit them all, all in here. Okay, so let's see. <clears throat> okay, here's part A. Okay, so part A, let's see, they want at what time, so we're looking for time, trying to solve for T, so don't be, don't plug something in for T, because that's the thing that you're looking for. At what time is the temperature of the pan? Let's read the problem that goes with it. A pizza is removed at 8 p.m. from an oven whose temperature is fixed at 400 degrees is fixed at 400 degrees Fahrenheit into a room. Now this is the surrounding temperature into a room that is a constant 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the temperature of the surroundings. Let's start labeling this stuff. So it comes out. This is going to stand for U sub zero, the initial temperature of the heated object, a pan in this case. Pizza's removed, a pizza and a pan. Okay, so this will be U sub zero, the initial temperature of the heated object, which is the pizza in its pan. And it's uh, brought into a room that is a constant 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And that 75 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature of the surroundings. So this is T, the temp of the surroundings. So let's see. Actually, if we're going to, we need to try and find for part A, we're going to have to try and find the K value. So let's see, at what time is the temperature going to go down to 125? So actually, we're going to have to do this in two parts. When we go to figure out at what time is the temperature of the pan 125 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when we will not be plugging in anything for T. We're going to be looking for it. But we actually can't find that until we know what K is. There's been no mention here of what K is. The, the rate at which the temperature is going down. So the very first thing I'm going to do, and let's write that formula that we're going to be using. We're going to use this formula, U of T. is equal to big T, initial temperature minus the temperature of the surrounding area, the surroundings. See, we don't know K. So we are actually going to have to use this. After five minutes, the pizza pan has gone down to a final temperature of 300 degrees. Final temp at five minutes. So if we know the final uh, temperature at five minutes, we could actually figure out the rate at which the temperature is dropping. The rate at which the temperature is dropping. We can take this 300 and put it right here. It is the 
final temperature. The ending amount would be the final temperature. So we can put the 300 degrees Fahrenheit right there. And then as far as T, well, that is the temperature of the surrounding. When we said that that is the room, this hot pan, this hot pizza in a pan is being brought into a room that is consistently 75 degrees. That's the surroundings it's being brought into. I'm not going to put the degrees or the Fahrenheit symbol or anything like that. Um, this is the initial um, temperature in the problem, which was, let's see, the initial temperature was 400. The initial temperature of the hot object coming out was 400. That pan was heated, pan with the pizza was heated to 400. Okay, so we have the initial temperature of the hot object, the hot pizza in the pan. We have the temperature of the surroundings, 75, and we happen to know that in within five minutes, the ending temperature, it had already gotten down to 300 degrees. So when we come over here to fill in this stuff, it's we don't know the rate, but it took five minutes for this to get down to 300. So we have everything except the K value. So in this way, we can find the K value first. So now let's clean all of this up the best we can. This is going to be, let's see, I think the very first thing I'll do, because we do want to isolate this E term right here so that we can end up taking the LN of both sides to finish solving it. So we want to try and move everything away from it. Right now you're looking at 75 plus 400 minus 75 is 325 as the coefficient of E raised up to a power of 5K. And then over here, there's a 300. If we move this 75 over here, that'll leave us with 225 is equal to, so that won't be there anymore, and then you'll have a 325 as the coefficient of this E raised up to a power of 5K. We're gonna get rid of the coefficient by dividing it right off of there. And notice that I've done this in every problem. I've always isolated that E term by dividing the coefficient right off of it, and then it's time to take the natural log of both sides. So this cancels 225 divided by 325. Is 0 0.692 308. I'll just write some of those so you can see the steps I'm doing. It's hard to show you that if I can't copy some numbers down blah, 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 and that's equal to um, e to the power of 5k. Okay, so now we have a decimal on the left and a des and a e to a power on the right-hand side, and this is when it's time to take the natural log of both sides, as I've shown in the last um, five problems. Take natural log here, natural log here. On this side, though, Natural log, you have an argument of E, face of E, so therefore they cancel, take the log with it, and down comes the exponent, the power. Then over here, you're going to do this in your calculator. I still have this entire number in my window, so I'm going to go ahead and take uh, ln of the answer that's already in there. ln, dump that in there by going second answer. The answer key is right next to the enter key. Okay, so then it'll get you this, negative 0.3677248 approximately, on and on and on, is equal to 5K. I'm going to finish this off by dividing by 5 and then dividing this by 5. So K is... 0.0735450. I'm going to leave it at that. That's good enough for numbers to carry for accuracy. 0735. 0735454450. Let's just take it there. Okay. So I finally have the K value, which again, they haven't asked me for this. 
but I didn't have enough information to just go in and answer the question that they wanted me to answer in part A, which is solve for T when this is the final temperature of the pan, when that's the end. They just gave me information that, hey, it took five minutes for it to get from 400 to 300. So that is how I went and um, figured out what the K is by putting in final temp, the temp that it landed at in five minutes. Now that I have this K value, you can go back and use this formula again. There it is right there. You evaluated at T. This time we don't know what the T is. And this will be the same, the 75. This will be the same. This will be the same. So we're still going to end up with 75 plus 325 coming from this. Only now we're not going to evaluate at time. We don't know that it's five minutes. That's the actual question. How much time does it take? Okay, so let's start over again there. Okay, so this formula where U sub T, remember this whole thing collectively stands for the final temp. This time in part A, they wanted us to go with a final temp of 125 degrees, which you can see right there. Uh, remember the temperature of the surroundings was 75. I'll just put this information in there again. The initial temperature was 400. You really don't need that degree symbol again temperature of the surroundings and we now know the K value remember it's E raised up to a power of K times T but we don't know the T we're solving for that this time so let's see the K was negative 0 0.0735450 times T that's the power on that E and I'm going to go ahead and solve this so that I can get the answer for part A. So this is A continued. So start off by subtracting 75 on both sides. That'll leave you with 50. Over here will be 325 times E to the negative 0.0735450. Times T. Then, just like we did in the previous uh, problem, when I went to go look for k, the previous part of this problem, I divided off that coefficient. Likewise over here, so you see you're doing the same thing quite a bit to get you used to how do you solve take by taking the log of each side, which, will pre which was um, you know, the theme of quite a few of the problems in the last section, then it you know, controls the entire section here. So 50 divided by 325, 50 divided, I mean the only ones that didn't have this in it was the compound interest problems. So that is point, get as many of these numbers as I can, 153, 84, 8462. I'm going to go with that, 153, And then here we have e to the negative 0.0735450. 450. Okay, then we're going to go ln of both sides. So we're going to go ln. Oops, running off the page here. And ln. So we're going to take the ln of this side, ln of this side. This has a base of E. These cancel. I'm giving me a running out of room here. Negative 0 0.0735450t. And then over here, we'll get this in our calculator. So it's going to be ln, dump that in there, second answer, close it up, and it's negative 1.87. I'm going to move this over so I can show you what I'm going to divide. So this will be negative 1.87. Try to get as many of those numbers. Uh, 180. So just like that goes on and on, but you're going to be dividing it by this. So I'm 
move this over a little bit. I'm going to be dividing this. Just got to give myself enough room. Um, this whole thing is still in that window, so divided by negative point oh seven three five four five zero, just like I'm going to divide this side by point oh seven three five four five zero. So this will cancel with this, leaving you with just the T. And then over here, it's the negative 1.871 divided by the 0 0.0735 divided by 0 0.0735. And then it was 450. 0.0735. And then it was uh, 450. 450. Three seven three five four. That's what you have to your eyes. Four five zero. Okay, so what I ended up getting there. Let me just do this again. This was negative one point eight seven one eight zero divided by negative point oh seven three five. Four five zero. So it was a negative divided by a negative. That makes it a positive number for time, which makes sense. Times positive, and it was approximately twenty five years. Okay. Finally, getting the answer for part A. Okay. So if the question. And wait a minute, this was, uh, let's see, that wasn't in years, this was in minutes. Everything was in minutes. Remember the five minutes at the beginning? So this was in minutes. And if the question specifically was at what time? Well, the pizza was taken out at 8 o'clock. It's removed at 8 p.m. And then by the time it goes, it cools down from the original 400 that it came out of the pizza oven in the pan at 400 and cooled down to 120. That took 25 minutes, so plus the 25 minutes. That means at 825 is when this condition was finally satisfied. You have to answer just how they ask. So it took 25 minutes. But if you add that to when this originally came out of the oven, that would make you, that would make it 825. Okay, so this is what you would actually feed in as an answer for my, to my math lab at 825. Okay, so now that we have the K value, we could at least use that in uh, part B. But in part B, now we get asked a different question. In part B, it says determine the time that needs to elapse. So you don't have to state it as 825 or 840. You can just actually give how many minutes it is. Whereas in part A, they want to know at what time. So in part B, basically how much time has elapsed. I guess I'll do it right here. I should probably move up instead of starting it there much room left here. So part B. At, determine the time that needs to elapse before the pan comes down to 190 degrees. You can see the formula still right here. Remember this is final temp. Always the final amount there. What's over on the left hand side in all these problems from example 2 to the one I'm on right now. So now we're coming down to 190 degrees is our final um, the temperature that we end up at rather than 125 that we used in part A. And all of this other information is the same. The temperature of, <coughs> of the surrounding room is 75. You really don't need these degrees while you're doing it, while you're working the problem. The initial temperature was um, 400.
minus the temp of the surrounding room. Just can you see it's all the same? Only now we know that K value, which we found before we finally got the answer, which was, I'm not going to write the small here, negative 0.07355. And there's a T right there. Sorry, I'm writing so small. Let's see if I can make this look better. I want you to be able to read it when you come back and look at it. It's not going to be any good if you can't read it. Okay, so this would have been 75. Initial temperature was 400 minus the 75, which is a little smaller, e to the negative 0 0.0735. Um, 450. 450 times 2. Okay, and then um, go through all the steps of cleaning it up. Subtract 75 from both sides, which would bring you down to 115. This would be gone. Here you would have 325, just like you keep getting in each of the steps that I've done, multiplied by e to the negative 0.0735. Divide off that coefficient. So it's 115 divided by 325. That ends up being 0.353846. But we'll get the actual number in the calculator so we can have an exact answer. Want the answer as exact as possible. 0.0735450. And you know the, the drill. We are now going to be taking the ln of both sides. But let's get this actual number just in case there were more digits here. So 115 divided by 325. That was one, you know, went pretty far. But I have some of the numbers right there just so you can actually see what I'm doing. But I'll keep this entire number in my calculator window for accuracy. So we're taking the ln of that number in the calculator. We're taking the ln of this side, that same thing, repeating of when it is necessary to use um, the log of each side to solve. Specifically natural log when the problems involve E because this will cancel with this, take the log with it, down comes the exponent. And then this, we're gonna go ln of that answer, and that's negative 1.38893, negative 1.03, 8893. And then we're going to divide this that gives you T is approximately when you put this divided by this into the calculator it's approximately rounding off here 14 minutes they didn't say at what time they just said how much time had to elapse so that would actually suffice as the answer okay the last part of this problem so let's separate this this was part b Everything from here to here is part A, and then part C. Let's see. 
What do you notice about the temperature as time passes? Okay, so let's see. Okay, so when we were at four minutes or at five minutes, it had gotten down to 300. And as we were at um, 25 minutes, it was at 125, getting closer and closer to the, the temperature of the room. And in 14 minutes, it was at 190. So what's basically happening here is, as you would expect, as more time passes, the ending temperature gets closer and closer to the temperature of the surrounding room or the temperature of the surroundings. That just kind of makes sense. As more time passes, the ending temp of the pizza in its pan Ending temp gets closer. There's again at five minutes, look how far off it is. This was at five minutes 300 compared to the temperature of the surroundings. That's pretty far, they're pretty far apart. Then you get into the 14 minutes scenario. Just if we compare all of these times that we have at 14 minutes. Um, uh, it's at 190 versus the temperature of the room, which was 75. So it's 115 degrees apart. And when you've gone out the maximum amount of time that, that um, surfaced in these answers was 25 minutes. And now it's at 125 versus 75. Here it's only 50 degrees apart. So as more time elapses, the ending temp gets closer to the surrounding temp. Okay, and that is the answer to parts A, B, and C. So lots of work. <laughs> okay, the last thing that we're going to look at. So we looked at right here let's see where did we look at that okay so when we were on this page I think we did a couple of problems like this we were looking at uninhibited growth which can also be used this same model can also be used for uninhibited decay where it just doesn't have a uh, you know a a top on there you know you can't you can it can just keep decaying and decaying or just keep growing and growing it's not limited so we had that problem where we used that model and we also had this problem where we used the same model and both of them were decay then we went to Newton's law which was had its own particular formula for Newton's law of cooling and now we're going to go and look at the type of growth and decay that is limited. So uh, these are modeled by what's called a logistic model. A logistic model describes situation where the growth or decay of the dependent variable is limited. It just doesn't go on and on and on. So uh, just like in, in those uh, uninhibited growth and decay models, if uh, the B value, which is t typically called the rate of growth or the rate of decay, if it happens to be positive, then that indicates growth, and it happens to be negative, then the model indicates decay. So that is our last type of problem. It has a formula in and of itself. And um, you see that in example six. We have a problem with, that looks just like this. It comes from this formula. So it says the logistic model, P evaluated at T, is 93.8105 divided by 1 plus 0.0304 times E raised up to a power of 0.1965 times T. And this model represents the percentage of households that do not own a personal computer 
since the year 1983. Very first question, they want to know what is this um, function evaluated at zero. So you're putting a zero in for t here as well as here. Okay, so in part A, let's do it up here so we can conserve room. This 93.8105 divided by 1 plus, you don't need that here, you can just go 0 0.0304 just to save some room, times e to the power of 0 0.1965 and we're evaluating at t equal to zero. So basically what this is, is uh, this times this is one. Anything raised to a power of um, one is itself. So let's see. Oh, now that's zero. So this is um, zero right here. So e to a power of zero is one. That's what I meant to say. And then one times point O three O four. It was just um, 0 0.0304 plus the one that you see down here. So this function evaluated at zero is 93.8105 at the top and then at the bottom 1 plus 0 0.0304. Okay, so we're there. This times this 0 0.0304 plus 1 is 1.0304. Um, and then when you um, do the division, this divided by this, it comes out to approximately 91. So this would be 91%. So when this... Um, experiment began and they began investigating how many homes don't have a personal computer. It began in the year 1983. So at zero years, that means zero years have elapsed since the experiment began where they started observing and, and um, collecting data. So at that time, 91% of the households did not have personal computers. Okay, that's um, part A. Okay, which sentence below describes what it means, what this answer means? I just said it verbally, so we should be able to pick out the answer here. So let's see. It's the percentage of households with a personal computer? No. They tell you right here, it represents percentage of households that do not own a personal computer. So that's not it. It's the year, it, P sub zero is the year that no house, households had a zero, com, no. The zero means zero years since 1983. That means at the onset of the data collection period. That's what that means. Uh, P sub zero is the year that all households, nope. P sub zero is percentage of households without a personal computer in the year 1983, right when the data collection period started. So this is the answer. Okay, part B, use a graphing utility to graph P evaluated at T, the P function. Choose the correct graph below. Okay, so I'm going to put this in. Turn it on. Clear. Go to Y is equal to. Clear out whatever is there. And then we're going to do um, this function. So we're going to do 93.8105 divided by, let's put all of this in parentheses since there's quite a bunch of business in the denominator, and it'll be 1 plus 0 0.0304 times e raised up to a power of 0.1965 times t. But, you know, they use a t here to stand for time in this function right here. But you can use x. Just remember that x stands for time. In years, because this time we're talking about years. So we'll put an x right there, because the point one nine six five was multiplied by t, but we're using x plus enter. 
And then we could use a standard window, but we want to make sure that we see the top of the graph and the bottom graph so we can pick the appropriate graph. So let's, uh, let's just try zoom standard to see how much of it looks like it's cut off. And we can always go in there and look at hmm, nothing. That's not good. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Divided by 1.E raised to. Okay, let's just try that again. So we'll go 93.8105 divided by, I might not have put the other parenthesis around there. So in this, um, here's the opening parenthesis, and then it's 1 plus 0 0.0304 times set the function um, e raised up to a power of 0.1965 times t or x, same thing. That's what it is. I closed the parentheses for the power on the e, but I need another parentheses to go with this original parentheses in the denominator. Press enter. Now graph. And still have a problem. Zoom, let's just try a standard window. I'm not sure why that's not coming out. That's pretty weird. Okay, I'll try it one more time. Piece of T. Divided by parenthesis there. Now we're getting something. Okay, so it starts there. Let's try and get to more of the x-axis. I'm going to adjust this manually. So window on my x-max, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go for the y-min. Let me see what my y-min is. I'm going to go as low as negative 10. And then my X max, I want to go out a little further. Just adjusting manually right now. I tried a zoom fit window. Let's see what this looks like now. So here comes the graph like this. Approaches, uh, give myself more of an X max. So window. Uh, 
Oh, there we go. Okay, so we can see that if we're looking at um, just the positive values, because all of these are given, they're only given the part of graph on the part of the graph on the positive um, side of the y-axis. So let's see. Looks like this one right here maxes out and then skims along the x-axis. It does not look like that. Let's see what the other two graphs look like. Well, definitely not that, definitely not that. So this is the graph that it is. Okay, so that would be part A. Okay, then moving on to, I think there's one more part here. Part C. Part C says, what percentage of households did not own a personal computer in 1995? So just knowing how to work with that um, formula, if you're going from 1983 and what was going on then after zero years had elapsed as we looked at in Part A, and then you're talking about looking at it again in 1995, well, from here to here, if you subtract these, um, the 12 years has elapsed. So T is equal to 12. So now you're going to be taking the function and evaluating it at 12. Because that would be in the year 1995. So it would be 93.8105. And then down here it would be 1 plus... 0 0.0304 times e to a power of 1965, and we are evaluating this situation in the year 1995, at which point 12 years has elapsed since uh, 1983, and that's why we're evaluating at 12. So remember this formula gives the percentage. We're going to put all of this into the calculator. Okay, so 93.8105 divided by parentheses 1 plus 0.0304 times e raised up to a power of 0.1996 whoops, too many nine, six, five, times 12, close it, close it, and we get approximately... 71%. And this says round to one decimal place as needed. So if we go to one decimal place, that would be, okay, from what we got, this would push this into 71.0. In what year did the percentage of households that do not own a computer reach a final percentage of 10%? So since this is an ending percentage, that means we're going to take that formula that we were working with, which was... Okay, so it started off like this. T of T is equal to 93.8105 divided by 1 plus 0 0.0305 times e to the point 0.1965 times T. Oh, but this time they're saying the final percentage is 10%. So when you go to do this problem, all you're going to do is in for P of T, you're going to put a 10 for 10%, because these are calculating percentage type numbers. So there's your percentage. And then copy this side over here.
and it says in what year. So I'm going to look for how many years out and then add that to 1983 when it started. So solve them for two. Okay, so this is going to be, I'm going to cross multiply to get rid of the fraction. So we're going to go this times all of this. So 10 times 1 plus 0.03. And I think that was an 0304. 0304 um, times e to the 0.1965t is equal to the top. We're just swinging all of this right up alongside the 10 to cross multiply the fraction right out of the problem. But this numerator stays here, 93.8105. Okay, multiplying by 10, you get 10, and then multiplying 10 times this, this becomes 0.304. And you multiply 10 times that coefficient. So that's the coefficient now. is equal to 93.8105. Okay, then we're going to take um, the 10 and bring it to the other side. So now at this point you have 0 0.304 times e to the 0.1965t as a power is equal to 83.8105. And we're going to divide this coefficient right off of here. 0 0.304, 0 0.304. We're going to have e to the 0.1965t. And then over here, divided by 0.304. So that would be uh, 275.6924342. And then remember how the main theme here for solving um, an exponential equation where you can't get the bases the same. Um, so you're going to just take the natural law of this side as well as this. Okay, so on this side, this basically melts away due to the inverse property, and down comes that exponent. We still have this number in the calculator window, so we could just go ln of the answer that's still sitting there. And that's about 5.619286. And then divide this coefficient right off of the t so we can finally solve for the number of years it took to get to 10 percent. Oh, sorry, let me just let me see everything going down. Okay, so I was at the point where I put the 10 in here, copied the right side of the equation, cross multiplied by 10. That made it look like this, 10 times this entire denominator leaving the 93.8105 on the other side. That gave me 10 as I distributed the 10 plus 10 times 0 0.0304, which is 0 0.304, still raised to a power 0.1965. Then I subtracted 10 from both sides. If you couldn't see this while I was working it, that gave me 83.8105. Then I wanted to divide that coefficient off the E so that I could go into the step where I take the ln of both sides. So I divided both by 0 0.304 got 275.692432, then I took the L on both sides.
And on this side, everything melted away except the 0.1965G. On this side, I got this number. And finally, in this step, I'm dividing by 0.1965. These are with T. Is approximately this divided by this. is approximately 29 years. So let's see how they phrase the question. In what year? So this is just how much time has elapsed. How much time it took for it to get down to 10% of the households not owning a personal computer. So if you want to actually answer the question that they're asking in part C, the year would be, well, data collection began in 1983, and then 29 years later, you were at a situation where you're at 10% of the households not having a computer. So 1983 plus 29 years of elapsed to get to that situation, that would put you in the year 2012. Wow, that section was exhausting. Okay, so that's everything. A little bit of uh, each of the different problems you're going to be expected to do in my lab math. Okay, that completes section 5.8.